Hello, it's Heather from the Sunshine and Power Cuts podcast. Unfortunately, Susie's lost her voice at the moment, but she's asked me to introduce to you this special bonus episode. Twice a year in March and August, I host an event called the Sunshine Summit. It is a week of live streams to recognize and celebrate connections and bring people together from around the world. In August 2018, Susie was one of my wonderful guests, and what follows is our conversation from that live stream. If you haven't seen the video version of it, I do recommend you check it out, and to see all previous and future summits, you can find them at sunshinesummit.live. We hope that you enjoy this as much as we enjoyed recording it, and we look forward to welcoming Susie back on the podcast next week. Hello and welcome to the Sunshine and Power Cuts Sunshine Summit 2018. My name is Heather and I am the host of Sunshine and Power Cuts, a podcast that features two types of episodes that alternate. Sunshine ones of inspiration drawn from nature and in the Power Cut ones, I share insights into my life living off the power grid. This week I'm bringing a week of live streams celebrating connections with some of the incredible people that I've had the chance to get to know over the past year and the connections that they've made on their journeys. So Today, for day four, I am very grateful to be joined by a person who has a real connection with nature. It is the essence of her podcast, and that is Susie Buttress of the Casual Birder podcast. Hi there, Heather. Thank you for joining me today. Um, You have the Casual Birder podcast, and it is about your casual birding experiences that you have. And we connected either in one of the community groups we were in on Facebook, like Lady Pod Squad, which is an incredible community, and the Underdog Pod Squad uh, podcast community there um, on Facebook. And Eventually, I reached out on Twitter and said, hey, Susie, I've listened to your show. I love it. I love what you do. I love the sound of it. It's very similar to mine in a way and wanted to know if you wanted to collaborate with me. And you very kindly said yes. And the, and, and here we are today. So <laughs> if you would like to tell everyone a little bit about yourself and how the Casual Puda podcast came to be, that would be great. Okay. Yeah. And first of all, can I just say how um, amazing your strategy was for getting me to listen to your show by telling me how fantastic mine was and how aligned we were. <laughs> but uh, I really do enjoy your show as well. And I urge people to listen because it's, uh, I love the, the dual aspect of your show. Thank you. And it's uh, teaching me quite a lot. So that's great. Um, so I have been a long time podcast listener and um, never really thought that I would have a podcast of my own. But I had a message that I wanted to get out. I, I've, I've been a passionate bird watcher for a lot, well, since I've been a child. But although I'm passionate about it, I, I'm quite casual about it. I will just fit my bird watching in around the other things that I'm doing. I do go on holidays and look for birds, and um, I do enjoy the time spent looking at birds but I'm not the sort of person to chase off around the country trying to find a particular bird. One of my strong um, impressions or one of my strong feelings is that when I speak to people about birds, very often they'll say, yeah, no, I'm not a bird watcher. I'm not one of those types of people because there's ideas about what a bird watcher is. Um, But then almost in the next breath, people generally say something like, oh, but I must tell you about this woodpecker that comes to my garden, or I must tell you about these birds I see in my garden. And all these people that say they're not bird watchers suddenly have all these tales of (laughs) the birds that they've seen. And I realised that actually there's lots and lots of people who, as part of their everyday chores, are noticing birds. And I think that's wonderful. And I thought, why not bring that message to even more people? Because since I've been doing the podcast and, and sharing my stories with people, I've had so many others that have said to me, I didn't even think of looking for birds before I heard your podcast, but now I'm standing at the bus stop noticing them. I'm at the train station noticing them. And people are are just noticing nature as part of their everyday lives. And I think that's tremendous. I love that part. I think that's awesome. (laughs) It aligns so much with what I'm trying to do, just inspire people to remember that nature is out there and to get out there. And I am just like everybody else. I'm a really busy person. And sometimes it's hard for me to even get out there. But since listening to your podcast, even I am taking more notice of the birds around me. And it was fun. Recently, you um, called for people to do a 10 minute bird watch and see what is out there because it doesn't take that long. And you just, just just take notice, though. Stop and take notice of what's out there and let you know what, what was happening. So, yeah, 
I love your podcast. <laughs> and um, thank you. And what's so exciting about that is uh, when I first started the show, I had no idea. I mean, I know the internet reaches a lot of people, but I had no idea quite how far reaching my audience would be. And not only have I got people in the UK and Europe listening, but I've got people across the world in Australia and New Zealand, in Canada and America. And what's really lovely is people tell me about the birds they're seeing and they might say something like, oh, I only have cardinals in my garden. And to me, it's like, oh, cardinals, I'd love to see a cardinal. And then I might say, oh, I've just got a blue tit or um, great tits in the garden or a Eurasian jay. And I mean, the jay is a little bit more special to me, but um, but then it's really fascinating for people living elsewhere that we have those birds in our garden and one of the things I learned early on, uh, my very first episode was on the blackbird, which is the Eurasian or the European blackbird. Mm -hmm. And um, I had no idea that there were a whole group of birds called blackbirds in America. And very quickly, people were telling me, you can't just call it blackbird because we have like 20 different species that are all known as blackbirds. Um, and they're all different types of birds as well. They're not all the same type of from the thrush family. They're a whole variety of birds. So um, that made me a little bit more careful about how I described the birds. Um, one of the things I said just now, which I shouldn't really have said, is how I've got some birds in my garden that I might feel a little bit more boring than others. And actually, I don't truly think that. I mm. I will see birds that I see every day. And familiarity can breed a little bit of contempt, but actually... I still enjoy seeing them. And it's through the through the lens of talking to people around the world, it's made me appreciate my local birds even more because to people elsewhere, my local birds are actually quite special and their birds are special to me. So none of us have um, boring birds. Yeah. We might have birds that we would prefer not to be around for various reasons, but you know, at the end of the day, they're all they're all really wonderful to see. Yeah, and they also have different um, behaviours and things. So I know that from where you can sit uh, and you've got a, is it an outside office space, like a separate um, place where you can record from? or edit At from? work, you mean? At home, in your garden, is it? Oh, yes, yes. I've got a summer house in the so, garden so I can I can go and sit out there and, and record. Yeah, and looking out the window and th when we had a chat one time, there were some birds and you were telling me that you know, when some are around, the others kind of stay back, hang back, and when they've gone, they come in. So, you know, even if they're common or they... That's absolutely. Um, that was uh, something that I'd noticed quite recently. I remember now that chat we had, we were talking using video chat, and it was a, quite a warm day here, so I had my patio windows open, and I kept getting distracted because I could see movement out the side of my uh, vision mm -hmm. and had to keep saying to you, oh, goldfinch has just turned up or oh a rook has just turned up and it was by looking at the, the large blackbirds and I noticed that so we have uh, members of the crow family we have rooks and jackdaws that come to the garden um, generally only during the time they have young we also have uh, carrion crows that are around they very rarely come in the garden but when they do all the songbirds just leave the garden mm -hmm. and I was very intrigued to see how when the rooks and jackdaws were in the garden the songbirds would stay around. And I think it's because of, of what the birds eat. They, the, the young, the uh, songbirds would see them, would be a threat, uh, sorry, it'd be a prey bird mm -hmm. to the carrion crows. But to the rooks and jackdaws, they're not. Although interestingly, I, I mentioned my theory to one of my other guests, um, Julian, who recently walked from Lands and Chadonna Groats to raise money for eye research. Mm -hmm. And uh, in his garden, the jackdaws are, are very much the aggressors. So it is interesting how even just within the same country, birds will act differently. Sorry, I've just realised I've gone off talking about birds, which is what I do all the time. <laughs> if I'm not talking about birds, I'm talking about podcasts. <laughs> That's awesome, Susie. That's what this is all about. And I love that you are so passionate about them and about <laughs> podcasting too. So if we want to just... Um, we've got a question from Bandrew from Podcastage. He said, what's the one bird that you would prefer not to be around if there is one? I think that's I think a I'm really good question. Yeah, um, uh, yeah. I'll come back to it because okay. th there are various birds. No, I'll come back to it because I don't have one species that I don't want to see. Okay. Yeah, when I did my 10-minute bird watch after you suggested it, um, I noticed quite we have quite a lot of birds here. And um, I also did a recording a little video recording on my phone and 
I think I was recording the Pukeko, which a uh, purple swamp hen um, and – yeah, they when they were walking across the lawn, That's I have a right. story that they used to have about 30 or more that used to hang out on my property and they're not here anymore and that those numbers, they're only, there was a two this particular day. And while they're pretty looking and they're kind of interesting, they're kind of a bird that I would prefer not to be around just because they're a little bit destructive and um, they attack other things as well. But I'm not going to go out of my way to make them not be around, although that's what I my theory is on why there aren't so many around anymore. I think that people have culled them out a little bit. So, yeah, um, Pukiko oh. are very funny, funny birds, but they are vicious to each other and a little bit vicious to other animals, like if you had chickens or um, other things, they kind of attack them and stuff, so... Um, so do you think that's because they're territorial and so they're protecting their totally. what they see as their territory? Yeah, totally. Yeah. They have a, I, uh, oh, just on that note, mm -hmm. sorry, I was just going to say, on that note, uh, they were, for, for people that haven't seen that video and for people in the UK, for example, uh, I was just going to say that they're um, of a similar family to more hens and coots mm -hmm. and they can also be, quite um, aggressive at times while they might look quite mild with other birds they can be quite aggressive so and I think that's you know the, obviously a trait that they have yeah they have very strong legs and they kind of jump on top of the other one and kind of rip them to bits with their legs <laughs> which is just like the coots would do they they are very aggressive for, especially during the breeding season when they're fighting for territories yeah so about that because you've become quite knowledgeable about a whole bunch of birds now and um, or a flock of birds. <laughs> What's the better term to refer to a group of birds? <laughs> sorry. Well, let's go for bunch. It's fine. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and so is that does has that come about con with connecting with um, books or other or just your experiences watching birds? How have you connected with the information to give you that knowledge? Well, um, I've been watching birds and observing birds ever since I was very young. Mm -hmm. And um, when I started the podcast I wanted to do it from my own position so from my own observations um I gather my own sound recordings yeah. some might say <laughs> they're not always best but I gather my own sound recordings and I use my own observations but sometimes I'll want to talk about birds that I either haven't seen very much of or haven't seen at all but they tie in with a bird that I do know quite well and yeah. um, so what I've been doing is looking to have people as guests on my show that can talk about the birds from their experiences what I wanted to do from very early on was avoid just looking at Wikipedia or just looking at other people's content I wanted to I wanted my show to be about the birds that I see and the birds that I share with others mm -hmm. so I wanted to hear bird tales from other people as well yeah. and that's how um, that's how I've set my show yeah, I love that because it's quite enriching hearing the different stories behind it. People bring, uh, they have different, we're in different locations for a start geographically, so our birds are different. And then we've got different attachments to different birds as well. So yeah, it's fascinating hearing that from people. And just going to the podcasting side of things, you've been a podcast listener before you began podcasting. So if you want to tell us a little bit of your backstory, that would be very cool. So I've been listening to podcasts for about 10 years. So I've been listening a very long time. Um, and uh, one of the earliest podcasts I was listening to was something called Stop Podcasting Yourself, which is a Canadian podcast. I've been listening to that for probably about eight or nine years. And um, they uh, joined a network uh, several years ago, the Maximum Fun Network. And gradually I started to listen to more and more podcasts on the Maximum Fun Network. And found that I really, really enjoyed them. They've got a great range of, of shows there and uh, became such a fan of, of the podcast there that um, I've become a monthly donor. Uh, so I have a, you know, I, I pay to help the creators that I enjoy listening to um, continue creating. And, um, but it's an American network. There is a, a British show on there, the Beef and Dairy Network, but um, most of the shows are American and I wanted to talk to people about the shows that I was listening to and no one I knew, I, I think less than three people knew what a podcast was when I was yeah. listening to them. 
And uh, that hasn't changed a great deal, I have to say. <laughs> it's getting better. Um, but also, if they had listened to podcasts, they hadn't listened to the ones that I listened to. Yeah. So uh, a couple of years ago, I went to the London Podcast Festival and uh, a couple of the Maximum Fun shows were uh, sh- were going to be performing live. And I connected with a few people there. And there was already a, a group that had just been started up uh, of fans of the shows. And so I joined the group. Yeah. And um, after the podcast festival, I wanted to continue to talk to people because this was amazing. It meant that I could talk to people about the shows that I love and they knew those shows as well. And so I started to arrange meetups in London for Maximum Fun fans. And um, and I've been doing that since. Um, since I've had the podcast, I've not had as many meetups for the Max Fun fans Um we we are still meeting up, but just not as frequently. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that's mainly because I've also started meeting up with podcasters. Um, because now that I've got my own podcast, I'm really keen to meet other podcasters. And it's really opened my eyes to the variety of shows that are out there mm-hmm. and um, the types of people that have podcasts. And it's just been such an amazingly, both the Max Fun community, so the the fan community that I'm part of, And then the podcasting community, so the creating community, just amazingly supportive people. And it just feels so wonderful to be part of, uh, to be able to reach out to people and, as you say, make connections with them Mm. and find that we're kind of on the same page about our passions. And that's just one of the wonderful things about the internet. I know the internet can have negative aspects, but to be able to reach out and find people that, have similar joys and similar excitements about things as you do. So, you know, we've probably all been there and had something that we're really passionate about and try to talk to friends and family about it. And we just can't connect because unless we're all watching the same show, Mm -hmm. because entertainment is so diverse now, it's really hard to to find people that can really understand your passion. So the fan communities build up. And and one of the wonderful things about them is that your community, uh, communicating with other fans yeah so you know you can be as geeky or as um as uh enthusiastic as you like because they're going to reflect that back to you yeah on that note Andrew asked is judge john hodgman on max fun con and if so are you a fan of that show oh my goodness <laughs> i can tell that Andrew hasn't been looking at my feeds at all because <laughs> judge john hodgman the show is one of my favorites and i'm a very big fan of john hodgman so yeah and you you don't have to look very far in my feeds to find that out <laughs> so yes the answer is a yes i was very lucky actually yeah i was very lucky to be able to meet him last year yeah. and uh, and that was amazing so on that note how did you get to meet him uh, well, that was part of that. He was um, appearing in the Judge John Hodgman podcast at uh, the podcast festival last year. Mm-hmm. And um, I organised a meetup for all of the fans to meet uh, Jesse Thorne, who um, is the um, owner of Max Fun uh, Network. And, um, and Judge John Hodgman uh, was on. Jesse plays the bailiff in that show as well. So to have both Jesse Thorne and John Hodgman come to the meetup was just. Um, amazing uh we also had jennifer marmer who is um the producer of the show and uh and uh, nick lau who's uh, one of the other producers but it was just amazing to have members of maximum fund network attend the meetup and i think people really really enjoyed being able to meet them and, and actually speak to them directly about how much the shows mean to us and mm. how much enjoyment we get from from the weekly shows yeah, that's incredible. And you've got you still got those connections with them because this year they had the Max Fun Con in LA. That was the event that you went to recently. So I'd love to hear more about that. I've heard about it, but I just um I hung on your every word last time. So <laughs> oh, you haven't you heard about it? You were kind <laughs> enough to let me speak for at length about my experiences there because that's one of the most wonderful things that's happened this year. Um so Maximum Fun um, very much enjoy the community aspect of of the fans. They they want people to be able to get together and and meet each other, enjoy friendships, and just enjoy. As I said before, about the sharing the passions of listening to the podcast or taking part in those fan communities. And so they've been hosting for quite a few years now uh, something called Max FunCon, which is um a small grouping of people, I think it's about 200 people 
were able to go to it. And uh, traditionally, uh, not traditionally, I can't think of the word, but uh, most of the time it's been held at Lake Arrowhead in California, but they have had some Max FunCon Easts on the East Coast, but they're, they're now keeping it in California. And um, I'd wanted to go for years. And amazingly, this year I was able to do it. So um, as I say, there's only 200 people that go. But I've been for some time uh, in a chat room uh, using Slack, which I only came across in the last couple of years, um, with some of the Max Fun fans. And we'd got chatting and, and, and I continue to go to this Slack because while it's great to use things like Facebook and, and other kinds of um, and Twitter, it doesn't give you the immediacy or the connection directly um, with someone chatting Mm. and so these are very much like the old-fashioned chat rooms but uh, just for the modern age and so I had built up some friendships in in the chat room and I knew that these were people that regularly went to Max Fun Con so when the opportunity came for me to be able to go as well that was just amazing because I already had friends that were going to be there and to be able to meet them in person uh, was just uh, just an added layer of uh, uh, awesomeness so i Honestly, it was a really emotional time for me to be there. But I was able to do, um, because of the podcast, I was able to um, lead some bird walks while I was there um, as part of the sort of, um, they have classes on uh, all sorts of things like learning how to do puppeteering or um, this year this was, and uh, or they had a coach that taught um, baseball moves. Um, and I, I was able to, with one of the other producers of, of Max Fun um, net, uh, podcasts, um, Kevin Ferguson, we uh, took uh, two groups of people out on a bird walk around the conference centre grounds. Normally, my husband and I spend our holidays, obviously, together, um, travelling as much as we can. And um, I got special dispensation this time to, <laughs> to be able to have a solo holiday. I would, I would really have loved him to come along. But while he listens to podcasts, he's nowhere near as fanatical about them as I am and what I wanted to do while I was out there is um, connect with people uh, conduct some interviews which I which I was able to do and um, to go on bird walks to gather more bird sounds and experiences while I was out there and and all of those experiences and interviews are gradually coming out now over the next couple of months I'm trying not to flood everyone with with them I'm Mm -hmm. trying to pace them but I've still got plenty of material from there Mm -hmm. Um, and what my husband did which was really lovely, um, was he He decided he was going to do a holiday that um, I no longer want to do, which is backpacking and camping. More than happy to go camping. I'm not so keen on backpacking anymore. Um, so he, he took himself off to the Scottish islands and, um, and did a backpacking holiday. But while he was there, he kept an audio diary of um of the nature that he was seeing and some of the encounters that he had with the wildlife which I won't go into now because it will be appearing on my podcast coming yep. up yep. um but he also recorded lots of bird sounds for me as well so that was really wonderful to have like a roving reporter for me um but it was great because he was sending me sound files to tell me about how his days were going while I was in hot California enjoying <laughs> <laughs> LA living yeah. Um, but yeah uh, this this year so far has been absolutely amazing yeah I think that's incredible I love that you have those connections with the Max Fun community and that you participate in the Max Fun Con I think that's an incredible opportunity to make connections with people um, to enjoy and celebrate the things that you've been listening to uh, the shows that you love on there and just yeah the opportunity to do the bird work and be a part of kind of the event itself in a way that's just wow and part of that yes amazing <laughs> yeah and then the slack group and having those connections before you went so the the friends that you were able to connect with and I love that about discord so discord is kind of like slack where it's a kind of the chat room function thing and it's been incredible for me we're going to talk about that a little bit later in this sunshine summit but yeah and your husband wasn't so keen to get on the mic in the beginning but he managed to get there and do the recordings for you while he was on his holiday. So it's cool that you're sharing that with him and he's come out on bird walks with you 
and I bought yeah I I I kind of made him do it because uh I was aware that he would he would probably get some wonderful soundscapes while he was up there so I just bought him a little mic a little it was actually the one that I'm wearing tonight a little one that will fold away very very discreet Mm -hmm. but that should he hear a bird that he thought I might like to hear he could just plug that into his iPhone and uh and and make the recording I think getting him on the show that that was never going to happen until I wanted to talk about the penguins uh, we've been lucky enough to to see penguins in the wild, and um, and he's got such great memory. He actually had slightly different experiences to me while we was while we were on that vacation, mm-hmm. and so I actually interviewed him for that show. And I think since then he's he's got a little bit uh, more comfortable with being on the show. And like for example, this last weekend we we did a bird walk at Watership Down in yeah. Hampshire, and um, and he featured on on the show there. It's cool though. They're like. I have a similar thing. My family are not went to into podcasts. Didn't know what they were. It's the same thing. My circle of people, not very. I've got one or two people who listen to podcasts before I brought it up with them, but it's kind of growing now, and there's getting a little bit of it's not huge, but a little bit of excitement there. But it is nice to be able to share that with someone who's that close to home, um, because we we are so passionate about it. So yeah, um, has there been there's things that you want to work on and go forward with and one of the cool things if you wanted to talk about it um is connecting with people in libraries so one of the things i mentioned earlier was that still uh for those of us that have podcasts or listen to podcasts a lot it can feel like well, of course, everyone knows what a podcast is. It's always, you know, you, you'll hear radio programs now even say, well, do listen to our podcast as well. And there's there's all sorts of ways you can find out about podcasts. And yet there's a large number of people, especially in the UK, who do, either don't know what a podcast is or have heard the word but don't really know what it is and haven't listened. Mm-hmm. And so in, in two ways. One way, because I want to share podcasts with people. I want people to enjoy the hours and hours and hours of free entertainment that there is and education as well uh, with people. But also um, it'd be great if people want to listen to my show a little bit more. I think every audience member that you build up, it's an audience member for everyone because Mm -hmm. people generally, once they start listening to podcasts, they don't listen to just one show. They'll listen to a variety of things. It's like when you're watching TV, Mm -hmm. you don't only watch one type of TV program. You'll watch a variety, just depending on your mood or, or what it is that you want to get out of the show. And it's the same with podcasts. So one thing that struck me is that people probably slightly older than me, I, I you know, I'm an older person myself, but I got a computer and started to become familiar with technology quite late on, um, just because it wasn't part of my growing up. And in fact, I didn't get my first computer until I was probably late 20s, early 30s. But of course, for children now growing up, technology is all around them. And it's, it's, it's second nature to have a Palm computer, something that, you know, your iPhone or your, your smartphone um, has access to so many things. But for people older than me that grew up without having smartphones, there can still be quite a, um, a reluctance to even have a mobile phone. Um, and if they have one, maybe only use it, you know, maybe they go as far as texting, but don't really use it very much. And I I know lots of people like that. So one of the things that I really felt passionate about and still do feel passionate about is trying to help people understand that there are thousands and thousands of hours of entertainment, education, information available in podcast form. And one of the other things that struck me is that there are a lot of people around who don't have access to their families anymore for whatever reason or don't have friendship groups especially the more sort of isolated older people and one of the amazing things about listening to podcasts is a you get to know the podcast hosts through the shows so you feel like you've got a friend in your ears um but also just through the shows very often there's some sort of fan community of all types of all types and so i feel like there's a wonderful connection that can be made for people especially people who possibly suffer from social isolation or social exclusion so I spoke to my local library because I wanted to try and find a way to help people access podcasts or even just know about them and um, it turned out that they were doing an event in October coming up that would tie in very nicely with that 
So um, I reached out to a few other podcasters and said, was there anyone in the local area that would want to, to help out with this? Mm-hmm. And um, amazingly, I found, <laughs> I found another three podcasters that I didn't even know about in the area. So for, for some time, I thought I was probably the only podcaster in my town, but turns out I'm not. <laughs> but actually, they were interested in reaching out too. And so we're, we're, we're getting together and we're going to provide one-on-one um, coaching sessions Uh, Sorry, that sounds a bit too grand. Basically, we're going to be at the library during this event. And should people want to find out about podcasts, we can tell them what they are. We can show them one to one at the pace that they want to listen to or uh, participate in how to find a podcast, how to download it and then how they would listen. And we'll give them a list of suggested podcasts that um, will be curated by us. But from the great fast knowledge of podcasts that that we've built up ourselves so it won't just be like it they have to listen to a bird podcast if they want to they can and Mm -hmm. I'll be very happy if it's mine (laughs) um but really it's just enabling people to know that there are thousands of hours of free entertainment available to everyone and it you know you could be listening to podcasts from around the world on a topic any topic you can think of there's a podcast on so if you've got a really niche um hobby or interest there's going to be a podcast out there for you. And it's just really fun to connect. Yeah. I think that though, it's cool that the library is doing the event. So what is the actual event about? Yeah, it's called the Get Online Week. And um, what that's for is to help people. Uh, I think, you know, there are, there are some boring uh, procedural things, like we have um, a system of universal credit and uh, for accessing that while it's still going to be accessible for people that don't have access to the internet, it's going to be that you can manage your accounts online. And so what the library are doing are helping people understand how they would actually access that because a lot of people either are nervous about using things online or just haven't had the experience. You know, if they've not had jobs where they've had to use computers and they haven't traditionally had computers in their home, it's actually quite daunting to find out that actually the only way, one of the only ways to access something is online Mm -hmm. or that you can get a lot more information from online so what the library is doing is is enabling people to do that um but they wanted to find some fun things to do as well and luckily they thought podcasting would be fun so um (laughs) so we're helping them out but it's actually going to go further than that i'm going to be what i found as part of my podcast which um i hadn't considered when i started was how being such an audio uh, medium for people with sight loss uh, it's a very accessible um, entertainment uh, medium and I've got uh, people listening to my show um, that have contacted me to say that they've either lost their sight through their life or or didn't have sight um, from when they were born but that they enjoy my show and I've been put in touch with um, quite a few people who are doing research into um, sight loss. And um, and I mentioned this to my local library and uh, they have um, some groups that meet up that are with people um, with um, sight loss. And so I'm going to be talking to them about accessing podcasts as well and, uh, and listening to podcasts. So it's given me an opportunity to do some talks as well. Um, which I'm quite excited about. That is awesome. We've got Charlotte White in the chat and she said that I love that you are spreading the word through libraries. Now, Charlotte is someone that I met very recently at uh, an event in London. And um, I did my usual thing of wanting, uh, I'll be honest, I get a little bit nervous when I go to events. I just have a little bit of anxiety going. And I have found for myself a great tip to get myself not to be nervous is to host something because then I, I'm concerned about other people's nervousness and making them feel comfortable or allowing them to feel comfortable and, uh, and not feeling nervous myself. And so there was this event recently in London and um, I really wanted to go to it, but I was a little bit nervous about going. So I suggested that a few of us meet up beforehand and quite a lot of people came along to it. And, and I had some great feedback afterwards to say that, you know, a lot of people feel this, uh, you know, they go to an event, they want to network, but actually it's quite daunting when you first get there and there's just a lot of people. It doesn't matter how friendly the people are, it's just daunting to see lots of people all together. Mm-hmm. So having this space was was really nice and Charlotte came along to that and um, and, and we connected there. So, um, sorry, what was Charlotte's question again? 
She just said that she loves that you are spreading the word through libraries. So welcome, Charlotte. I'm so glad that you can make it to the live stream today to hang out with us and celebrate with Susie. It's so nice to have you there. I think the the libraries kind of bring people together in a community like that's they're branching out and helping the community, especially the older community or ones who don't have that digi digital experience to help them learn and feel safe about it because I mean it's like you said daunting and overwhelming and they need someone to go at their own pace because they're not going to get it if they went to just anywhere I mean yeah I think librarians have patience <laughs> <laughs> well I think also in families now as I mentioned earlier you know the children are growing up with technology and they yeah. they almost know it as a, a second it's almost as easy as breathing to yeah. access technology uh, but what I found is that younger people, and, and we were all guilty of it, um, sometimes think that older people, they can't get with it. So if you're trying to explain how something works, when you're young, you're, you're a little bit impatient because you know how it works. Why can't these people understand how things work? And so that can, can actually make people feel um, withdrawn about asking for help mm -hmm. because you don't want to appear like you can't get it. And I can see both sides because I'm incredibly enthusiastic about it. But, you know, there are things that I don't get to and I need a little bit of extra coaching to, to get somewhere. So I think it's very important that people are able to do things at, at their own pace. And, and you know, I'm going to the extreme end of one-on-one of, um, -on -one conversations with people just to help them find the information. Um and you know, if I if I make one person a podcast fan, then that's great. Yeah. I know it's only one person at a time, and there's a lot of audience out there to to reach. But you know, for every one person, if they start to really enjoy listening, they'll tell their friends, and that's right. it will snowball from there. Yeah, I have a saying that all it takes is a spark, and that spark of generosity of your time with one person, you don't know the ripple effect that that can have, and it's just incredible. Adam's in the live chat and he said that his wife is going back to school to be a librarian. So that's quite cool. Oh, wow. And Bandrew said, hashtag, hashtag libraries are the best. <laughs> and <laughs> Tim said, everyone should have to teach computers to use to older folks. It really helps to teach patients. But yeah, I think that it's awesome that if there are, and if the podcasters that you connected with are keen to participate and help as well, so that there's a few of you there able to do that. That is awesome. And going back to the sight loss thing, you connected with Julian. You mentioned him briefly, but he did a massive walk and he was he was raising funds for that. So if you want to tell us a little bit about that, because I think that was an incredible journey that he went on and your connection with him. Yeah, so um, quite early on in my podcasting, um, uh, Sarah Bell from Exeter University contacted me um, and we had some exchanges. So she's doing some research into um, connecting with nature uh, via senses other than sight and she introduced me to Julian and Julian uh, is a very keen um, birder mm -hmm. he's uh, been a fan of looking watching birds listening to birds all his life um, and he has a genetic uh, condition that meant he was going to lose his sight at some point um, and he wasn't sure when um, and it happened in 2010 that he started to lose his sight. Um, so he's now become a passionate, um, a, a, what do you call it, a proponent of ensuring that there's money for eye research because that is one of the areas of research, medical research, that tends to be overlooked and underfunded. And uh, so Julian came up with this amazing idea to walk from Land's End to John O'Groats uh, with a team to really publicise a variety of things, but the primary thing was to raise money for eye research. Now, given that Julian is such a fan of birds, um, I was able to uh, talk to him for my show and I interviewed him before he started the journey. Hmm. And he was telling me about all the wonderful birds that he has in his garden. Sounds absolutely amazing there. Um, but one of the things he was interested in doing was seeing how... Uh, what birds he could hear as he was moving through the country. So starting from the southwest in Cornwall and then moving all the way up through England and then into Scotland and right up to the north of Scotland, how the birds he would hear uh, would change both with, it took him, I think, just over seven weeks to, to walk it. And it was during the key breeding period. So there were lots of birds sung around. Oh. Um, but I was able to talk to him halfway through the journey and then again when he finished just to sort of hear about his experiences and 
and what birds he was hearing. And um, yeah, that, that was absolutely fascinating to be able to connect with Julian and to help um, help publicise the, the, the good cause that he was doing the walk for, um, but also to hear about the birds he was hearing. Yeah, that's incredible. And I love that there's research being done into connecting with nature with other senses too, because you take that for granted. I can look out the window now and see what's out there. I can also hear it. But I think, and coming back to kind of like my podcast and relating it to yours is that mine is about slowing down and you say about slowing down. Um, you generously lent me a clip that you'd recorded about what birding means to you and how it makes you feel, um, which is awesome. I included that in a podcast episode of mine. Absolutely. And, you know, listening to nature is, um, you know, for those of us that are fortunate enough to have hearing still, it's another way to find out what birds are around us because so often you uh, focus just on, you know, keeping your head, well, actually, to be honest, I was going to say keeping your head down, being on your iPhone. But actually, if you're listening to your environment, you can do that and still notice that there's some goldfinches there or a bullfinch that's just flown by. Um I think I'm quite attuned to bird calls. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm not a music listener very much. I'm I'm very much a spoken word person, mm -hmm. which is why I enjoy podcasts so much. Yeah. But um, I will note I have noticed a lot that I really tune into bird calls, and so if I I can be in my house doing housework occasionally um but I can be doing chores actually inside the house and and above all other noises I can hear that there's something going on outside I can hear a bird call and uh, that will generally get me rushing to the window to see what bird is out there and I've gradually built up a knowledge of of the birds that are around mm -hmm. but only really woodland birds or garden birds there's masses masses more birds that I don't know the calls of so there's so much more for me to learn um to get out there and do and that's awesome that you're excited about that. And I would love one day if, because you've traveled, and uh, one day if your travels take, bring you all the way down to the bottom of the world, to New Zealand, that would be, well, not the bottom of the world, but to this far, <laughs> to New Zealand, that would be amazing. <laughs> I'll be the bottom of the world to you, but um, <laughs> you might go see behind me. I have a couple of New Zealand guidebooks. It's definitely on our plans to be coming down there. Yes. And uh, I, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that. Um but again, uh, just this weekend, um, someone in New Zealand sent me a sound file of some of the birds that they have in their garden. And it's just it's just things like that, just hearing, oh, my gosh, that's so exciting. I want to hear that bird, too. So, yes, if you wouldn't mind sending me just a few more sound recordings, each time you send me something, I'm coming that little bit closer to you. <laughs> I'll get on it. I'll spam you with bird songs so you can come faster. No, <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Yeah. Um, John is in the chat and he said, I saw a goldfinch for the first time. It's actually native to Alberta and some of North America. It was beautiful. That's really cool. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. They're beautiful birds. Um, I wonder if that's uh, the American goldfinch that he's talking about, um, which is in the summer plumage is a really beautiful golden yellow bird with um, black head. Um, and we have the European goldfinch over here in the UK and Europe. And that is a much more multicolored bird. Yeah. Um, has very similar characteristics to the European gold, uh, sorry, to the American goldfinch in terms of the shape of the bill and uh, mannerisms. But it's interesting how they're, they're such different looking birds. Now, goldfinch is named for the gold panels in the wings. Okay. But when I first saw my first American goldfinch and the colors, it, the vibrancy of the yellow is just stunning, just yeah. beautiful. He said, yes, it was the American goldfinch. A couple of the birds that hang out here, I have fantails. I have um, kingfishers, which sit on my fence posts, and they're pretty funny. Um, they just sit there and kind of look out, and then off they dash to somewhere. Um, we've got the plovers, or plovers as I like to call them, which I mentioned um, to you, and I, they have bizarre behavior. <laughs> they're really fun and entertaining to watch, plus they've kind of got a screech that's they're a bird that I could wouldn't mind if they didn't come back. Oh, yes. <laughs> I remember you telling me about those. Yes, very, uh, very strange calls. Yes. Yeah. And then we've got the pukiko, like I said, and we've got blackbirds and sparrows and, and things. So, And there's um, harrier hawks, New Zealand harrier hawks that fly around too, which is kind of interesting. And they're, they're quite majestic. I like I like them. And um, what was the other yeah. one? Magpies. And they're funny. They sit there and call out and sing and funny birds. Yes, because your magpies are they are they similar to the Australian magpies? I think so. The, um, 
Yeah, so they're, they're different to our magpies. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting that they've, they've all got a similar name. But uh, when I first saw the magpies, because we went to Australia a few years ago, when I first saw those ones and heard the, the songs that they they come out with, they've, they've got a real range of vocalisations that they can make. Yeah. And they're quite, they seem quite um, cheeky birds. Mm-hmm. It seems to me that they could get into mischief. Yeah. It's like a warble. Quite characterful. Quite characterful. Quite, yeah. I really enjoy them. They're quite a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I love that you're encouraging people to just take a few minutes to stop and listen because we can rush and we can forget and we just take it for granted. But it's it's amazing what you do notice when you do take the time. That is one thing I I hadn't really considered before that I get a lot of peace from watching the birds um, especially if I'm feeling particularly stressed. And I've, I've been doing it more and more since I've had the podcast, actually going out for walks and listening to the birds that I hear when I go out. Yeah. Because when you're focusing on the birds, it does take you out of yourself a little bit because you're suddenly noticing the dramas around you that are happening in the bird world. Mm. It just gives you those few moments of, of just space to, to get your own head back together again. And so I highly recommend you know, just taking that time out in nature. And I know that's something that I want to do is make more connections in those areas as well. Um, I was very lucky that my sunshine episodes have been recommended to a mental health practitioner here in New Zealand as a thing for meditation and to help people. So that was an incredible lift. It was one of my listeners who recommended it for me. So thank you so much um, for doing that. How can we connect with you and the Casual Buddha podcast? Um, if you want to email me, you can email me at casualbirderpod at gmail.com. Um, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, generally, it's always casual bird or something. So on Twitter, I'm at casual bird or pod, and I'm on Instagram at casual bird or podcast. I have a Facebook page, mm-hmm. um, and that's the casual bird or podcast. But join the group. Come yeah. and speak to us in the group because there's a lot of us in the group and um, and it's nice to have those conversations. You can post photographs of the birds you're seeing. And I really, really do like seeing other people's photographs and hearing the tales that they have. Um, it's not all about me. It's mostly about me, but it's not really. <laughs> it's about everyone. <laughs> but you're doing, and the birds. It's about the birds. You're doing a wonderful job, Susie. I love listening to your podcast. Um, yeah, so please do listen to the Casual Birder podcast with Susie and hang out, go and find her in the Facebook group because it's an awesome place to hang out and sh- and take 10 minutes, do a casual birding experience, just take notice of what's around you, slow down, give yourself that gift of nature, which is a quote by someone I can't remember who the author is at the moment, <laughs> but do, do give yourself the gift of nature because it does, it does help calm you down and, and lift you up and make you feel amazing. I look forward to chatting again sometime soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heather.